Okay, good. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are at. Um, and welcome, <clears throat> welcome to uh, today's workshop. It will be conducted by Dr. Natalie Skiapers. I'm just going to do a short introduction and then uh, Natalie can take, take, uh, take the lead. Okay, uh, so Natalie is a seasoned governance, risk and independent compliance consultant and has a wide range of, of industry experience that stretches across the public and private sector over the last 20 years. She holds a PhD in engineering management from the University of Johannesburg. She has, the, she has a master's in science in health and safety, a MPhil in HIV AIDS management degree, and she also serves on several boards as a non-executive director. Um, she will be discussing selling safety to your senior management or board, direct, board of directors. Thank you very much, Natalie. The floor is yours. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you for doing this. And uh, we can all say, um, you know, you're doing great work. Uh, Fabian and I were just discussing earlier on before you guys got on board that um, yeah, some of us, we just hide away under the tables with our skill, you know, under the bushel. So he's really pulled me out of my hiding places. Um, for a lot of reasons, uh, I suppose we all get busy. But thank you for joining. What I'm going to try and do, uh, this, this, there was so much um, thoughts that went into this presentation. And I tried to think about you know, all the people that's joining the level uh, you are at and where you are in your organization. So uh, there may be issues around, well, you don't have access to the level of the board or senior management, but um, I've over the years learned some tricks that I will share with you. And it's, it's stuff that has worked for me. So uh, here we go. So thank you. Those are my uh, details. and. Credentials, welcome on board. Um, I'm very unconventional in terms of how I do presentations, so you're not going to find any wording or stuff because I want you to listen to what I'm saying. Right. So, okay. So, your safety converse, conversation, right? Um, and when I say safety, please, it means health, it means quality. I know people get very edgy when you just say safety, but by now, if you're in this space, you would know that safety means everything. I mean, sometimes you are even the counselor, you are every, they call on you, you HR. So safety means everything. Most leaders are busy people. So um, you need to know and you need to understand how to access them and where do you sell your story. And I looked at a very simple example um, that we are currently going through in South Africa, not the COVID. Um, a few months ago in 2017, 2017, 2018, if you could recall, a piece of legislation was passed around the usage of, of cannabis, right? And how that unfolded and how that became sort of legal and how um, a person is allowed in your private space, and I mentioned private space, to use cannabis and Another word would be daha or marijuana. So if you could recall that that legislation was passed and maybe not in your country, but let's say for, for the purposes of the discussion, um, you now had this issue. It may or may not be um, a conversation happening at board level, but how do you start that conversation? How do you sell that conversation? And this will appeal to everyone. It will appeal to you whether you are on just entering into the business of safety or you just becoming um, a safety professional or you're in senior management because it may not be on top of everybody's mind at the time. So I'm gonna try and tell you some, some things that you could or could have done or should do. So for the better part of it, what does the board of directors do? Um, firstly, when you say board of directors, it means these people provide oversight and at most you will have two individuals that will be none, that will be executives on that board. Sometimes your CFO and of course your CEO. So he or she would have that position on the board. And at most 10 to 11, 12 people are external people, right? 
So the board of directors are people that manage the organization from an oversight and provide governance. And I'm not going to go into that lecture. That's something I can do later on. But here you are now, you sit with the board of directors and you need to have this conversation with them. At most, the board of directors with the CEO, they focused on understanding the commercial uh, strategies of the organization. And then they would include the uh, people strategies that would forge the future of the organization in terms of the business. And if I wanted to be more serious about this, I would have said every business you can, even if you're selling ice cream, your business is about making profits, right? So when you're throwing darts at this problem or you want to further the cause of health and safety, you must understand that you are not the only one that's occupying the minds of the board of directors, right? Because they are also concerned with priorities. Um, if we were to talk about COVID, everybody's thinking about how do we deal and manage with this. And in the meantime, there's other things coming through the cracks that they've got to deal with. But I'm not going to talk too much about the COVID issues. I want to stick to how do you navigate through getting your, your issue being addressed at board level. And let's use the substance abuse, specifically the marijuana um, regulations um, that came out. So the board is concerned with other priorities. Now I serve on quite a few boards and I have been for the last 15, I think, years. And over time, the, the issue around safety gets chipped away because when I'm in a board meeting, I cannot just think about the company's safety. I've got to think about, is the, is the organization going to be sustainable in terms of finance? And then sometimes there's issues with the unions. Then there's sometimes issues with restructuring. And there's so many things that gets the attention of the board. And whatever priority happens to come to the top at that time in that day is, is what probably will be focused on, like what's happening now with COVID, right? And now your little issue about incidents and somebody died down there in a plant far away. Yes, we will hear about it and we'll record it and, and things will be dealt with in a, in a, in a very uh, sanitary way, you know, uh, uh, with the family and with policies and stuff. But let's say that issue could affect the organization in five years because the board's oversight is actually there uh, for the longevity of the organization, sustainability. So they need to know some things. And I can tell you, it is also, uh, it also happens a lot of times that some of the management around the table will want to block those things, right? So I'm gonna try and share some of those um, issues that you, you can talk about. So consider that a typical board is composed of prominent successful individuals and how they get nominated and in terms of their skills, their influence, <clears throat> sorry, to that board. Excuse me. So most, most of the board members would have been selected on that board because of their skills. And if you look at various contexts in public sector, most of the nominations would be through organizations or it would be that you apply and then you're on that board. And let me also be honest, you will also find that on that very same board where we're saying that there's a lot of skilled uh, individuals, there are no skills on that board. I'm being, I'm being honest. You, you sit with half of your team and you wonder how did they get here, right? But that's not your problem. You need to work the system. Uh, also, board members are not full-time. They're not there every day to be listening to what's going on the ground. They're not there every day to hear the issues that staff um, are encountering, the problems that uh, are not being resolved, the commitments that are not being made. So it, it is a, a space where um, you're literally there four times a year, sometimes six times a year, depending on the entity that you are engaged in. And I mean, I'm, hello, please put off your mic. So, uh, you can imagine the, the type of energy uh, that you need to um, 
you know, have to, to serve on, on the board and the activities and the packs that come through you. So it's not always true that they don't want to listen to you. It is really what is on the agenda of the day. So how do you start that conversation? Who, who are your key players? And we talk about the C-suite. And I'll explain that. Your chief executive officer, chief operations officer, your people officer. I mean, there's fancier names coming out nowadays. I mean, the chief people officer is like basically your HR person. So um, that's, that's really um, the, the changes in that. So it's all your C-suite executives that you need to engage. Some of you may be in these roles. Some of you may be a chief risk officer, or maybe you're part of some team that you sit with the chief operations officer. But that team and you are not the people that will be engaging the board when you need to make your presentation. The presentation will probably be given to someone that will be given to someone else, and that person will make that presentation on your behalf unless you are specifically invited to that meeting to come and deliver the presentation. So how do you start the conversation with the stranger? And at most, these people are not in your space. You don't see them. You don't even know that they are in the office. Board members come and go. Sometimes if you're lucky, you'll bump into them in the corridor, or sometimes you know that they have certain parking allocated. Um, well, how do you start that conversation with the stranger? And I'm gonna try and give you some of these tips because this is really uh, the stuff that I've learned throughout the years, you know? So when, when eventually, um, I will come back to the tips later on, but let's say eventually you have that opportunity to come and present to the board. And this is where the presentation will now start getting interest because that elephant has walked through that door and that elephant has to represent um, the cause of the day or come and talk about the, the marijuana policy that he or she thinks it's so important. Okay, so dealing with the elephant in the room, you got to get the attention of the people that make the decision, how to start that conversation and where to take it. Uh, this, this slide that I have here may sound like it's very elementary and it's very banal, but let me tell you, from the get-go, your body language will speak volumes of um, how you are going to be received in that meeting. And what you're saying, um, how authentic you are, using emotional intelligence, being articulate, and um, asking great questions as well. So don't underestimate, and I'm, I'm going to emphasize on communication skills. Yes, I get it. Not everybody's command for English may be, uh, you know, in, in UK terms that it's British, uh, the level of English. But if you stick to your articulation in terms of your safety communication that you want to communicate, one of the things is you've got to prepare. You've got to know that once you come into that room and you are in that um, space with your seniors or the board, be prepared because um, unfortunately, we also judge people. We also listen to what they say. For example, if you've been given 12 minutes, stick to your 12 minutes, okay? Stick to the 12 minutes that you've been given to and speak to the cause, which I will deal later uh, um, with, and make sure that when you arrive there, you are spot on. What am I talking about? Preparedness. If you're going to come to a board meeting and I'm stepping into the zone of being a board member, as a professional, I've had many other safety professionals come into a room and they embarrass you because you've allowed that platform, you've allowed that item on the agenda. They come there and talk a lot of nonsense. They can't even remember the OSH Act uh, um, 85 of 1993 or things that they're saying. And now I'm like, whoa, I've really um, embarrassed myself. Why did I even allow this? So I'm going to tell you how to deal with that kind of preparedness, okay? So as the, the, the safety professional or the safety owner, 
you know, uh, why is it that HR is in the boardroom and we're not in the boardroom as safety professionals? Maybe the risk professional is in the boardroom uh, or have a platform, but um, I can tell you why, because at most in South Africa or in <coughs> most countries, we have not sold safety to be a business driver or a, a deal maker. Safety is like an add-on, and in my capacity, when I was still growing up in this profession, um, I used to hear a lot of uh, things like, it's a grudge purchase. Just think about it, you're a cost center, because you, you supposedly add no value to the organization. This is what they say. How do you add value? A cost center means that you come to the organization, you're in the cost center, you, you're getting paid sellers, but you're contributing nothing to the production line. Here's the problem. We contribute a lot to the production line because if it's not because of our services, our skills, um, you know, then a lot of incidents would happen. But we sell ourselves short. We, we undervalue the contribution we make. And at most, most of us do not go beyond educating ourselves to know everything about everything. If we had to have the Q&A, um, later on, and I had to ask you the ins and outs about how do you, who have you, who of you have introduced um, a policy on substance abuse and dealing with marijuana as of 2018, and making sure that not only breathalyzers are taken at work, but now we've moved on to a level where we're actually testing people's urine and all that. You will, you will see for yourself that. Um, it's like we, we dread certain um, issues in, in the workspace. And some of these issues, like uh, what I'm um, talking about, the substance abuse, can actually catapult uh, your, 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 your reputation and your career. You need to find that one thing. Unfortunately, now COVID is on everybody's mind, so that boat has sailed. You can't be that specialist. You can't be that guru. You, you can't use this because there's too much information. But if you had to look at your organization and look at where they're making the losses, why there's the injuries, you need to find that thing, that unique thing that nobody else can, can deal with. So that's when you gain that respect as a professional. I also want to say, you know, I do um, acknowledge that a lot of times we prepare uh, materials and we provide um, professional advice and somebody else steals our information and goes and presents it to the board or to management as if it is their own. Let me pause there. It's okay. It's okay if they do that because what is between your ears, yeah, your brains, is certain things that nobody can take from you. Um, so don't feel offended. I'm telling you now as a professional, I remember throughout my career, I had, I was very angry about a lot of things that, but that's my presentation, that's my information, that's, I presented this to my boss, I shared this with my colleague, it's okay, let them steal it, but the, the, the way it was formed and put together, there will always be holes in it, and they will have to come back to you, they, you can start protecting your, your information, and you can start, you know, putting watermarks on it, but watermarks can be removed. So uh, just grow up in that space and it will help you develop other skills, you know, to deal with the disappointments of what happens because I know people steal your information and you will not be um, regarded as someone that contributes. So that's a, another presentation for another day. Anyway, so um, we are always seen to be um, people that talk about compliance. I'm begging you to not do that. Do not go into a boardroom and talk about compliance. Do you think that board members don't know they mustn't comply? And sometimes that's the least of their concerns that, okay, we need to tick that. Because the picture is always bigger than what you see it is, as is. It cannot be, I mean, the, our whole existence as a business is because of compliance. You've got to comply with so many laws, and that's why you have risk and compliance. So you, if you're going to stand on that platform and try and preach compliance, you've lost it, okay? So um, I'm just going to move on. Now to the details, your proposal. Please, when you 
do get an opportunity to make a proposal or to go and present at a senior level or a board level, please do discuss it with your manager. There are a lot of people in the system that eventually when you need their back, the budget, the, the accreditations and stuff, you cannot just because some board member, and it has happened a lot of times, sorry, where somebody would um, corner you in, a, in, a, in, a, in the parking lot and say, board member, I want to tell you about this and this and this. Can I have a gap and come and present? And even as a board member, we make mistakes. We, we would say, okay, I'm going to allow you. Then what I would do, I'll say to the company secretary, um, I want so-and-so to come and present on, on the substance abuse policy because I heard something. Now, poor, this poor guy, uh, he probably is thinking he's taking an instruction from me. And now he doesn't discuss this proposal with his bosses or immediate bosses. And when he gets there, his boss will be in that meeting because somebody has to be there from the division or the department. Don't ever, if you think you're clever and smart, take it from me. Take your proposal to your immediate manager. Even if they don't like it, you share it with them. And here's another tip. Everything you do in this life, make sure that it's on email or you have record of a discussion. Because they will say, no, they never told me that um, this is the problem or something is happening. Uh, okay. Then you have a record that you actually did call up a meeting with your manager and you wanted to discuss. Right. So tip, tip number one is don't bypass protocol and people's positions. You will pay for it dearly, my dear friend. You've got to abide by protocols. And in some of our cultures, and I'm speaking from South Africa, it's also very appropriate to respect your elders or respect the line of communication or the line of authority. Yes, uh, you may be the one sitting with the PhD or the degrees. Do not, not discuss any proposal with your managers. You may not like it, but it's fine. You've dealt the, the hand and then you move on. If, if that's not going to serve at the board, because maybe he's got other priorities. So tip number two, if you want to tag on any board member, right, or any board or any management, remind them of the company's values. What is the values that we abide to in this organization? Uh, see, I've, I've double duplicated it. Is it trust? Is it integrity? Is it leadership? Is it flexibility? Is it commitment? Find out in your own space, what is it that drives this organization? Because we are quick to say that these are our company values and then we soon forget it. So uh, I found a neck through, um, when I want to tug on people's hearts and minds, I remind them, all my slides, when I share something, I start off, um, guys, I want to remind you that these are our values. So if, if the values at most would include, and it would be, you know, we like the same old, same old, trust, integrity, and honesty, then you in, then you can tug on everything. Say, what are the, the trust issues that we need to create between us and the safety department or what you are presenting? What, has, what are the issues around honesty or integrity? So if everything else fails in your slide presentation, you have to put this in front of them to say, we have certain values in this organization that we adhere to. And um, this is my position on that. Then you start explaining what needs to be done. Um, you obviously would submit your proposal. And that, that's another presentation that I can't do today to say how does the actual documentation and the process, how does it work through to get to the board on, uh, through the company secretary. That's something else that I can deal with later on. Now, back to my topic, substance abuse, marijuana, keeping safe on top priority. How do I actually do that? Um, how do I engage these senior people that come here to this uh, organization every four times, four times a year. I don't see them. How do I make sure that it's a priority, right? We spoke about the values and how you are going to articulate how you see those very same values, okay? And then take 
the trust issues, integrity, the teamwork, respect, articulate that in your own words, like what I've got on this slide. Okay, so if respect, for example, is one of the values, and then you will then translate that into how you have understood it in the safety context. You need to connect the dots. Okay, now, please, I said earlier on compliance, um, I know we do this very good, very well. As a inspector at the Department of Labor many years, this was drilled into me. I know the regulations and the act back to back. I can quote it in my sleep. I know it, it's in there. It's like the Bible in my case. It's, I, know, I know my thing, but a lot of us cannot take the actual regulations and make it practical. Things that have been going around are hazardous biological agents. It's always been in the regulations. Now we have COVID. Do you have a policy at work? Do you have a procedure at work that has ever dealt with HBA? The regulations, the facilities regulations, um, you know, and I can go into detail. I always tell a, a few jokes when I do presentations, but I don't know if I'm allowed to do that, Fabian. But anyway, uh, there's a question I ask. You are free, you are free. If, to your yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll keep the jokes for later. But there's a question I always ask people in, in the facilities regulations. And, uh, and I asked these to the safety professionals. Where in the regulations would you find the issue around toilet paper and toilet seats? Most of them will tell you, oh, this, 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 it's in the regulations, but I won't tell them it's in the facilities regulations. I said, yeah, it's in the regulations. Do you know that the regulations is very specific around that an employer must have toilet paper? An employer must have running water. An employer must have a toilet seat on a toilet. Now, it's two different things. A toilet seat is not the rim of the toilet. A toilet seat is a toilet seat. But there's a long story that I tell in my, in my, my training as to how, about, how that toilet seat came about and why today we have a toilet seat on the toilet. I'm not going to do that today. If you want me to do that presentation, Fabian, I'll do it later. But here it goes. That toilet seat being embedded in the facilities regulations did not just arrive there. You need to understand the history. So as seasoned, um, as Fabian put it, when he says seasoned safety, this and so he means basically I'm old. I've been around the block. So as seasoned safety professionals, we know that regulations are written because they are written in blood, okay? That means somebody had to die. Look at the COVID regulations. Why would they have COVID regulations? Because people have died, okay? Anyway, let me move on. So please don't go to management and the board and people like myself, because I will technically, if I'm in the boardroom, I would know, yeah, we need to comply. So, so why, why you keep on punting compliance? Tell me what I need to do. Tell me what is the issue, what needs to be addressed. We know that we need to comply. We are a compliant organization. Right. What you could do is connect the dots. Okay. Talk about the triple bottom line. But for you to do this, that means you need to know the business in and out. I find a lot of safety practitioners, professionals, they actually don't understand the very own business that they're working for or in. They don't understand the organization. They don't know how the organization makes its money. They don't know what was the headline earnings. They just go to work and go back home and be that safety professional. And when I'm in that boardroom, I'm like, whoa, this guy really doesn't know what he's talking about. I keep quiet because I'm not gonna defend you, right? Some professionals, um, and I remember this one organization where I'm a board at, all he was doing was being the policeman. And please be honest with me, um, guys, we are not policemen, we are advisors. If you see what an advisor does, you are not the policeman. Because the problem with being a policeman is that the next day when you try to be an advisor, the very own people that you try to police are going to disrespect you. 
okay? They'll only fear you once you have that stick or that uniform on or that whistle. And you'll never ever gain that uh, respect back if you're gonna be uh, a policeman. An advisor is someone that helps, that shows, that walks the talk, that, that actually can connect and um, have empathy sometimes with the people. I think over the years, a lot of us have crossed that line. We think that we've become the bee's knees now. We, we, we better because we are safety professionals. No, you, you, you got to look at yourself as that person that's the advisor. But for you to be an advisor, you cannot just know the regulations. For you to be an advisor, you must know everything about everything. If I do a survey at the end of this presentation, I want to know in the South African context, how many of you actually have read and read and read and read the constitution of South Africa? And then I would go further and say, which part in the constitution addresses health and safety? And then I would go further and say, sir, do you have a copy of the constitution um, at hand or can you access it? Most people will say no. And if I want to be funny about it, and sorry, I'm just diverting a little bit. And I'll ask, do you understand how the spheres of government work? The executive, parliament, cabinet, do you know the difference? Do you know the, how law is passed? And why I'm, I'm, I'm harping on this is, when, when the substance abuse um, was published, everybody was surprised that how did we get here? that marijuana is now going to be legal. But hello, it was published in the, in the newspapers as part of the bill for us to comment. Let me ask you, how many of you safety professionals actually contributed to that comment that went to parliament before they passed it? Um, and, and this is why I'm saying you need to find that niche. I'm going to say that I was one of the people that had something to say. I even wrote an article in the city press, if you read our local newspapers, right, about how the process would unfold. Because I, I regard myself as a, a, a specialist and I have to say something about it. So things are published every day in the newspapers. There's a bill coming out that affects your day to run, day running and functioning of your organization. And you need to find that gap to get to the board. Let me not be going down that road. Let me ask about the ergonomics regulations. Did you contribute? Uh, Georgina, I know you're on, online, and um, remember we had that little discussion where we called a few people and we wanted to make a contribution. That same regulations is now passed. It affects all of us, it affects our business. Now here's the thing, as that regulations that have been passed, how has it found its way in the policy of the organization up until the top of, of management into the board level. If not, this is your opportunity. How do you get your organization to understand you need to redesign the workplace? Now it's gonna be even worse uh, because we have to re reconsider and redesign the workplace, okay? Right, so putting your points together and your thoughts about what you need to address. It's, it's a meticulous process. You don't just wake up today and say, oh my goodness, I'm going to do um, and say this and go to management and tell them. Uh, to be honest, it took me about two weeks to think about this presentation and put it together. Fabian has been tugging at me for almost two, two weeks for a date until last week and he said, listen, yeah, I'm putting the stake in the ground. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you for that. So I didn't just come up with this presentation. I didn't just... Uh, put it together yesterday. I'm being very honest. It took me two weeks to think about what is it that I want to talk about? How am I going to deliver this? Um, what is it that I can share? And how do I share with you guys without sounding arrogant or without uh, um, dismissing you know, your thoughts? Um, it's a process, right? I have to get to a point where I'm bridging that gap and I'm sharing the information in such a way that it's, it's not too high, it's not too low, and it's not too stupid, okay? Uh, without disrespecting the audience. So how do you bridge that gap to get to your, your board of directors or your senior management, right? So first you could think of painting a picture. 
I'll tell you this story. I, I had a boss once. He knew nothing about safety, but he was damn good in the, in the, in the boardrooms. He knew his way around. He knew how to, to, to lobby everybody. So he said to me the one day, paint me a picture. This safety that you're talking about, what, paint this picture to me. And I then the lights went on because I could show him, okay, here's the regulations that talk about, um, uh, let's not use ergonomics. It wasn't ergonomics then. It was something else, something to do in occupational health. Oh, yeah, it had to do with functional capacity evaluations. And that's a term that if you don't understand it, I'll just quickly explain it. It means that you will functionally uh, able to fit the job, not job description, functionally. You can fit the job. So you can bend, you can stoop, you can reach. You can crawl under. So if your job is a truck driver, you must be able to reach the, the and, and climb up the truck, right? It had a lot of aspects. So I had to draw him a picture to say that the reason why we need this procedure, this policy, it connects with HR, but it also connects with safety. And this is how the two work together. Because if you do the wrong recruitment, you're going to get the wrong placement. The person won't be able to do the work because functionally they're unable to fit uh, into that organization's requirements. And that is something that is so unheard of in South Africa. That's why we employ people. And then when you get to work, the guy says, but um, I'm unable to do this work. I've, I don't have, I, I, let me use another example. I'm colorblind for that matter, right? Or I've got other um, occupational related illnesses, diseases, or complications. And then it's like, how did you get this job to do this? You need to be functionally fit. Okay, and then to put all that together, to present it to upper management, senior management, to the board so that we can have a policy that sort of contradicts um, hiring of, of uh, persons in safety in terms of the inherent requirement of the job, right? Another topic it has to be the inherent requirement of the position, not job description. And he understood me. And I didn't need him to be a safety practitioner. I just wanted him to connect the dots and so that he understands me, okay? So, no unplanned surprises. You're not in the board meeting to go and sell newspapers or in the senior management meeting to go and sell the whole skabang. You need to speak to the issue. I know we are so passionate about what we do, Fabian. I know it. I mean, I love even this presentation. I love talking to people. I love doing this. But man, oh man, I can get off the rails very quickly. I get off the rails and that's why this for me is good. It's structured, stick to the script and all that because you have 12 minutes. If you're going to go and sell the daily news or you're going to go and sell what, anything and everything that's happening in an organization with safety, you've missed the point. Most of all, you've lost your credibility. They're going to say, don't bring back that fool because that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Then the next time, your boss has to go and do that presentation and he's going to be fumbling around because he doesn't know your craft. He doesn't know your skill. So use your skills and do your homework, okay? Um, and don't be an alarmist, okay? An alarmist is, oh, the world is going to come to an end if we don't do X, Y, and Z. No, it's not. I know what I'm talking about. I've had people that says, if we don't test all these people, tomorrow there's going to be no organization. Some of these organizations have been around with those incidents happening daily and they've carried on. So how are you going to target their hearts to say that there's got to be change? How are you going to do that? What are you going to communicate? Right? Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Nobody wants a smart ass in the presence and I'm saying this with even a PhD on my head. I can't go there and talk thesis and doctorate nonsense. It's not going to work. Sometimes I even remove that title because I want people to respect my, my craft. They must respect what I'm trying to say. They must hear what I'm saying. They must forget about my titles and where I come from and what I've done and how many horses I've, I've been on. Keep it simple. What did I say earlier on in the presentation? I said a lot of these board members are people that come from my diverse backgrounds. Sometimes they are appointed by our government. Sometimes they're appointed by institutions, organizations, and 
they, the, the command for English may even not be proper, you know, they may not understand it the way Fabian understands English being from Peter Marisburg, right? You guys be good English. Um, so keep it simple. You will never ever be uh, uh, um, slaughtered because you were trying to be simpleton. But if you come there and talk about hyperboles and things that are way above people's uh, ideas, it's not going to help your cause, right? So be that person. But how do you also do that? Now, I also wanted to say that you, you do this by identifying the drivers of safety in the organization. What drives the organization? Um, at that point, sorry about that, it, got, it could be the bottom line, it could be corporate social investment, it could be that the reputation um, um, issues. Uh, you need to know what are the drivers um, of safety in the organization. And only you can know that if you do research and if you do not go around pushing your ideas um, and giving direct audits you know, to, to people about what you want to do. You, you have to do research. You've got to ask people. You've got to get other people's inputs. Say, listen, yeah, I'm going to present to the board. What do you think? I'm going to present to management. Well, you know, in this case, it could even be that you're going to present to the union. Um, I've had opportunities where I had to go speak to the union about the substance abuse um, testing that's going to happen at a certain site. And this was not... Um, alcohol testing, um, it was about taking urine and, uh, samples, sometimes air samples, because we had a problem with drug use back in the day at a certain spot, and have a communication plan. And you got to respect everyone's views. So at one site, I got there, and people said, but here we like smoking marijuana, or here we know people are taking tuk, or, you know, but you, you have to involve the people that eventually this policy or the discussion is going to impact on. So you have safety behind you and you have the numbers backing you. So your presentation to the board should not be that difficult. Um, I like this slide. It says, don't trust everything you see. Even salt looks like sugar. I'm not going to be philosophical about it. Um, sometimes we push out numbers and we do not test whether these numbers, incident rates, or your missed call, your, your uh, uh, incident recalls issues are, are correct. Go and verify information. Don't trust everything you see, okay? Make sure about your facts. And uh, on a level where you deal with upper management, senior management, they deal with facts because at some point during the course of the next year, there's going to be something called an annual report that needs to be published. And if you're giving wrong information or you're reflecting information that is a bit tweaked so that you can get that platform, it will come back to bite you. So, right. Sell the output more than the input. What is the output? The output is where do you want this uh, presentation um, to take you to. So the well-being of the people, for example, you sell the output, not leading, lagging indicators. Man, I know that it's a nice topic and I know people love that topic, but sell the people, sell the output, sell the fact that we're in the business of people. Remember that slide I heard on earlier with the two circles that said the, uh, the business of people? You sell the output. What do you want to achieve? So Okay, now you have a marijuana policy that you want the board to consider. What is the output? Yes, we want people to have healthier lives. We want to the, them to be more focused at work. We want them to be safe. We want their families to be safe. Not you going there and saying, I know there's 20 people in that corner that's smoking, so we need to test those 20 people. No, 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 no. Um, we don't get personal in safety, right? Right, I've said you need to get employees to contribute and share issues at hand. Well-researched, real problems. How, how do you research in an organization? I'm not talking about a thesis when you're trying to um, write a thesis. You ask questions, then you ask more questions and you verify the answers. 
and you go to HR, you get fixed, or you go to some operations manager. Research, you got to get the feel of the situation. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm saying this because I know that sometimes we like to work on um, what we think we, we feel, we've experienced or what somebody said. Curate the information. Curate means you just check it, okay? Sift through the issues. Make sure that, um, so if there's information coming through that you want to share to the board or you want to share about the ergonomics policy, curate it. You can't go get everything on, on the presentation to the board. Pick something that you know that will be of interest and of value to the organization and the board will consider that. I had a client that wanted to revamp the whole building and make sure that everybody has the ergonomically designed chairs and everything. And I'm like, can you afford this? Um, is this something that the organization and will the board approve of this? Because we're talking about millions of rents, right? So make sure that you look for that punchline. And remember, it's all always about perspective. Now, Perspective is very important for us ladies because we can be very much of drama queens. Yeah, I can be a drama queen. So remember, is the glass half full or is it half empty? What do you say, Fabian? Is that glass half full or half empty? It, it tells you a lot about, before you answer, <laughs> it tells you a lot about the person as well, okay? Is your glass half full or half empty? Half full. So optimist. what does that mean? It means that you are able to see the other person's view, okay? You are able to see perspective and it also talks about empathy. Don't always be that alarmist, that drama queen. I've done this, guys. That's why I'm telling you. When I wanted things to be approved and when I wanted things to be done, I have been this half empty. Everything was always wrong. Nothing was going right. The policies aren't working. Everybody's failing their audits. Um, no, you have to look at perspective um, and present an honest um, case, for example, and create trust with your people that you are, are dealing with because trust is important. If you don't do that, um, Things will get swept under the carpet and they'll say, ah, we'll deal with that later on. It's not that, you know. And trust is like a glass. When it's broken, it can become very dangerous, right? So you need to earn trust and you need to be called upon as someone that will be honest, that will have credible information, someone that will present the situation as, as honest with integrity, right? We've said you must lobby for support get one-on-one -on -one conversation okay so some of these slides should have been up there then let's say um things go well and you are asked to to continue with the conversation you you must create an opportunity you know, if you have a platform and you leave there and you don't ask them listen um when can i come back and present again or how do i conclude on whatever, but you must provide opportunities for ongoing in engagement, be it through the structures. And most of us have structures in our organizations, your work forums or your unions or management committees. You could even start building up from those little committees before you get to the board level. But engagement is the leading indicator in managing safety, okay? Not audits, it's not a leading indicator. Engagement is because people know things that they will tell you when they have you in a room or when you sit down with them and talk to them, not when you go and do an order trying to catch them out. I hate that um, thing that when you know we do orders, people think you're there to catch them out. But an audit is needed on some platforms. It's needed for some reasons. Sometimes you need, need it because the shareholder wants it, but your role as a safety practitioner professional is engagement. That's a leading indicator. That's, that's what you should be measured on, not anything else. Have you engaged people? Have you explained things to them? Have you spoken to them? That's why your police hat won't work because you can't engage people 
when you have a gun or a firearm on your holster on, and your hand is on it and you're trying to talk to someone. Can you imagine that scene? I'm talking to someone, but I've got my hand here. Nobody's going to talk to you. They're going to look at your, your body language. They're going to say, oh my gosh, when is he going to draw that firearm? So don't be that person, okay? Right, I said identify. And then the on, onboarding, you probably have an opportunity to go and onboard different departments, different de uh, um, committees onto your, your, your issue if it is this marijuana policy that you're developing or it's the ergonomics uh, discussion you're having. Onboarding, you're not an island. And um, when I had uh, been, when, when I was running departments and I had people on, on my team, the most of all, I wanted them to be the guys that's doing the work. They are um, in charge of projects. They are the one, they are the one onboarding everybody. I would just be there sitting, taking the notes, the advice and say, okay, I think you must do this and that. But onboard people so that they can own it. And, and when they own it, there's accountability. But um, if you're going to go around and own all the projects, all the decisions, all the inputs, nobody's going to be onboarded. Okay. Right. So if you leave the board and they say, look, um, we've got a budget, we'll give you uh, something to start a process. Um, but sorry, what you presented today, we can't do that today. We don't have a um, the energy, we don't have the time, the, we've got other pressing issues, priorities. Meet the board halfway, meet management halfway. It's not a do or die situation or it's all for nothing. That's why I said um, half, half um, glass half full, half empty. Take what you can get, run with that half a loaf of white bread under your arm. I'll run with it and say, light, I've got my foot in the door and now I can start um, being to be known to be you know, the influencer. Okay, then action plans, you've got to follow through. I'm almost done. Uh, I'm almost done. So if you don't get it right, right, this is my favorite slide. When you walk out there and say, yarr, now I really messed up. What have I done? What have I said? Okay, it's your first presentation. You made an um, oopsie. Don't be hard on yourself. You probably made an impression and you will probably have to find a way to get back on that horse, back in the boardroom to get uh, your presentation um, presented again or to redo what you've done or undo what you've done. But don't be hard on yourself. We all make mistakes and um, we, we all have to learn with managing our own expectations and other people's expectations, okay? Remember a lot of times uh, people don't know what safety professionals do. Let me tell you, today with the COVID, everybody's looking for a safety professional that can tell them how to do this and sanitize this. And um, I'm just looking at my slides on the side. So don't be hard on yourself. Make sure that um, you find a way back and forgive yourself and move on because uh, we make mistakes. So I'll tell you this one story. I was in a boardroom once and um, my colleagues had presented um, lies, not my colleagues, it was another department. So this operations manager said no, that they've done the investigation, they've done everything to the T and they started blaming my department for not coming to the party and all that. Now, earlier on, I said to you, keep records, keep meticulous records. You may not voice record people, but you can write stuff down. There's no law that says you can't write stuff down, right? And I was in this meeting and I sat there and I felt like, uh, I really felt like a squirrel. They were like just carrying on and saying, oh, we were inefficient, we did nothing. My boss is sitting right opposite me and he's giving me the eyes, you know, he's like, you know that deep look like what I'm doing now. Anyway, I was so angry, I got up there and I started telling them off. I gave them a piece of my mind. Nobody has ever in that organization seen me get off the rails like that. It was the first time that my buttons were pressed so hard that 
I, I reacted in an outburst. I just, I was close to cursing them. But thank goodness, um, someone was sitting next to me and just patting my hand. I told them off. Uh, you know what? Every time I meet somebody else from other departments, they all recall that day where I, I went off the rail, but they, I made an impression, but it wasn't a good one. I had to go back and apologize. And then later on, what I did, I scanned the notes that I made and I sent it to the CEO and I said to him, I just want you to know that I don't come to meetings to lie. If I don't know something, I will tell you I don't. If I didn't have anything at hand, I will say so. But for someone to sit there and say that we've done nothing, here are my notes, here's the dates of the meetings we've had. I'm not going to attach emails because I don't think it's necessary, but I want you to have this. So the next, next time I got invited back to the meeting, I did apologize. And uh, I don't think that individual works there anymore because um, I stood my ground and I knew what I was doing. And of course, I could save face because I talk facts. Um, so don't be hard on yourself. Now, just some tips, right? I didn't put it in here, but there is, there is one or two that, um, slides that talks about lobbying. How do you lobby a board member when you never see them, when you don't know when they arrive or whatever? Guys, it's easy. You've got a thing called the internet. You need to Google people. You need to know everything about the, the audience that you are going to address. You must know how many uh, sugars he takes in his, in his tea, for that matter. I'm being now very silly about it, but you must know. What if you bump into some, some board member at SPA and you happen to find him there and you, you realize that, oh, wow, this guy plays golf. You can start a conversation. Remember, a conversation with a stranger. And then you would, by the way, say, oh, no, I work for that company and all that. You need to lobby. You need to know how to lobby people. You need to know that before you go into that meeting, there's two or three people that have already heard your presentation. They've taken you through the yeses and the noes. Maybe two of the operations directors that sit there. If not, on your exco, go speak to supply chain. If you're presenting something on changing the boots, I did that once. I said, I don't want my guys to wear this boots. I want new boots. So I lobbied the supply chain manager or director. I explained to him everything about why I didn't like the boots. And I, th I thought that, well, not I thought, I showed him that it doesn't last long. I had records of uh, people complaining about their feet, smelling, um, the socks that don't work in those boots and all that. So I lobbied him, and then the next person I targeted was the, 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 the HR person. I tugged on her heart. I said, would you want to wear the same pair of boots every day for two weeks? So that was my cause. By the time I got to the meeting, I had two people that basically had to agree. It was the HR and the, 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 the supply chain guy. They just ticked, no, nope, I think it's a good idea. Let's change a boot. The other three... They didn't, have a, they didn't have a chance because my presentation was solid. We changed the boots in the organization and people are wearing caterpillars and not the other name that I can't mention. So you must find a way to tug onto people's hearts and to get yourself into that organization. But you can't go there with waffle and with, with, with things that don't make sense. Because here's the thing, my last thought. You're going to go in a boardroom and you're going to find me there. And you have not researched who's on the board and you have not thought about looking at the profiles and I'm sitting there and I've got this extensive experience in health and safety. And then you walk in Fabian and come and talk nonsense and I will shoot everything down because you did not check your audience out. You came there and you pretended to know everything. And the one person that should have been in your corner is going to say to you, Fabian, the last time I checked X, Y, and Z, and the last time I looked at so-and-so, this did not work. Why are you not telling the board that? Then you've lost all credibility. So if you forget everything else that I've said, in any setting, any meeting, if you're going for an interview for a job, know who your proponents are, know who you're going to speak to, and know your story. And that's it. Wow. Thank you. 
Connor. Thank you. Connor. 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 Connor.
find out what, what it is in safety, because safety is a very, very big topic. It's a very big field. Find out what you like in this space. Um, be authentic about that and make sure you know your craft. And keep in your network. Make, make, also make sure you, you have a few people that if you, if you really have issues that you want to debate, you can call them and you can agree to disagree professionally. It's okay. Unfortunately, we all want to be smart asses. We don't want to, to agree that, I mean, if I want to be honest with you, this leading uh, lagging indicators doesn't sit well with me. But I will not um, call out people and, and this, um, this their uh, craft and their profession because they have created uh, uh, an impression on their work around them, which I may not like. But you must find what your passion is and you must find what you like. Now, I like speaking and I can speak on any topic because I'm very good at doing my homework, putting stuff together. I do take long um, to do stuff and I coach some safety professionals. Georgina is one of them. You know, I'll coach her and tell her, look, just do this and that. Um, but I think you must be passionate about what you want to do. If you don't like this profession, get out. Go and do something else. You know, um, also, don't be that policeman. Nobody likes policemen. I mean, you know what we do when we see a traffic cop? We only comply when we see that radar thing uh, between there and between when you pass the, the, the traffic cop. And then you don't comply. But be interested in, in, in people that you work with and people's lives and the ideas. If I must say um, something that has also helped me, there's a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. If you forget everything that I've said, buy yourself. I mean, the copy is even on the internet. Get a copy of that book and read it to understand how people's psychology work and how to deal with people. And, and it took me a long, long time to get there. Uh, you're not gonna be everybody's flavor of the day. You know, um, even sitting on the board, there were times where I thought, why am I on this board? Nobody likes me. Nobody wants to work with me. They, they don't see what I see. And I had to learn to do everything that I've told you today. I have to unlearn some of my uh, bad ways. I uh, let me call it bad ways because you can become arrogant, you can become deceitful, and then you think because you this person, you know everything. Even a PhD won't help you in certain circumstances. Doesn't mean because you got all qualifications and, and that you got to work with people. And if you don't like to work with people, then don't do this. And then on a personal level, this is my favorite. Please don't stop at having a same track in a what do they do nowadays, Fabian? Certificate in uh, NetSAM. Yeah. SAM uh, What else? SAM track. Uh, All the whatever. short courses. Yeah. No, don't be those people. Be professional people that, like the lawyers, you know, they mm. keep on um, improving themselves, reading stuff. And maybe when things go um, the way Fabian uh, is planning it, we will start doing peer review articles where you write professionally and get respected as a professional, even though there are 22,000 of us in South Africa. The yeah. other 20,000 are sitting with same track. The others are sitting with qualifications. I don't even know. If I have to start the topic on occupational health, you know, I can call out a lot of professionals because they only focus on safety. Sure. I'm upfront. I don't do uh, environment. Mm -mm, don't even call me. <laughs> That's not my thing. Yeah. yeah. But if you ask me Find about occupational niche. health, yes. Yeah. If you talk about occupational health, I can tell you a lot about occupational health. Now, yeah. if I ask safety professionals, they can't tell you. Yeah. So That's my cool. friend, uh, it's a very good uh, question because I've, I have a lot of safety professionals that call me and say, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to improve this. Go and do an a added course on HR. Understand how HR works or, or legal. Doesn't mean because you're a safety professional, you can't be a, a, a legal person as well, you know? Yeah, um, I don't know where you're at and what you're doing. Look at Fabian, where you're working in India. Mm, yeah, yeah I'm in India. It's, it, it's stuff that sometimes um, 
you, you're going to have to say yes to other projects. You're going to have to say no. Mm -hmm. Look, he, for, your, for your sins, you're sitting somewhere. But I don't think I'll have the guts to do that. But we are so stuck, eh? Yeah. We're so stuck. And, okay, one last tip. Go onto YouTube and learn about things that you don't know. Not safety things. Learn yeah. about other things. Anything. How to fold a napkin. I'm being now <laughs> silly. Right? And go. I do this every morning. When I wake up, uh, I, I watch a TED Talk. You guys know TED Talk? Yes, yes. TED We're trying to actually yeah. make this a TEDx HSE platform. That's yeah. our intention overall. Yeah. So go and, 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 and watch a TED Talk. It's 20 minutes max. I watch it every day religiously. It's like, I mean, sometimes I'm so ashamed. I, I do TED Talk more than I even have read my Bible, you know, if you're in spiritual things. Yeah. So I do a TED Talk every morning. And yesterday, I did a TED Talk on Monica Lewinsky on, on how um, she, um, she was shamed and how the investment of the public mm. almost caused her to, to commit suicide. Sure. And you know that, that that brought a lot of empathy on me because I was one of the people that used to say, wow, come on, don't mm. tell me this and that. But she talks about her deep things that happen in her life. And, and the one thing she left me with, the, she said, you know what? I was in love with this man. Sure. She didn't see him as a president. It changed my whole outlook to her and her life. So what I'm trying to say to you, have a bigger perspective about life. It's not always the way it's presented. And educate yourself about anything. Because when you walk in a boardroom, they'll ask you, so um, anything. They, they think because you're a safety person, you must know about Ebola and who knows what. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Okay, one last one there. See.